I guess the my main motivation in putting together this webinar, customized software for the rapid life cycle assessment of sugar and associated energy products, is really to raise awareness of some potentially very useful software and capabilities uh, developed in the area of LCA um, as a result of a, a recently um, completed project. In terms of what I'd propose to uh, cover in the next 40 minutes or so, um, I'd like to say a little bit about the origins and purpose of our life, of life cycle assessment, why we, why we bother. Um, I've included a few LCA basics. Um, I'm assuming that I have a mixed audience. Um, not everyone's an LCA expert. I think it's important to appreciate some of those basics in order to um, understand, I guess, some of the features of the software which I'll be talking about. Um, I'll then cover the actual software itself, um, what's, what it involves, um, what it does, and so on. It's been used to in a, a regional um, case study, a couple of regional case studies, which I'll, I'll present as well. And we've also used the software for other agricultural production systems, ones that are potentially of interest to the sugar industry, and I'll be, I'll be covering those. Um, I'll say a bit about accessing the LCA, LCA software and then, uh, and then wrapping up at that stage. So why should we care about LCA? I guess to start to answer this, I've, I've stolen a quote from one of the um, Bibles of Australian LCA, which says um, that a series of studies at local, national, and global level all tell the same story. We're overusing the natural resources of the planet and stressing its natural systems. Well, I guess one of, the, um, one of the questions that arises from statements like that is, how do we know that we're overstressing uh, our environment? And to what extent? And uh, what part of the environment is, is, is under stress? And if we undertake any measures to improve uh, things, uh, do we have any uh, way of determining how much improvement uh, we've, we've brought about? And LCA, although it's not an exact or perfect science, it does go some way towards answering um, some of these questions. So what, what exactly do we mean by LCA? Um, uh, I suppose a good enough definition is found in one of the international standards rela relating to S um, LCA, which says it's a compilation and evaluation of the inputs, outputs, and the potential environmental impacts of a product system throughout its life cycle. So um, to illustrate that, I've got a, um, a, a schematic, if you like, of a LCA of the sugar industry, which um, I've borrowed off Marguerite Renouf. Um, and essentially, um, it shows here the carbon emissions uh, associated with sugarcane production and its, uh, and its products. Um, and if you start here up at this end, we're looking at uh, all the emissions associated with um, uh, acquiring the resources uh, to actually um, uh, run the industry um, and build the infrastructure. Uh, some of those resources go into producing a lot of the farm inputs, so fertilizer and, uh, and, and uh, other, other inputs. Then actually um, farming the land, uh, there's a lot of inputs there in terms of um, diesel and so on used to uh, drive the farm machinery. Um, harvesting, transport, processing, and then going off to refining. Uh, sugar um, products potentially go off to, um, uh, to uh, uh, other end products, such as power and, uh, and uh, ethanol. And if you start to think about it, it's, it's really quite a significant amount of information that you're collecting together. So for example, in, when I do a life cycle assessment of the sugar industry, I have to get down to the detail of um, the emissions associated with producing the steel for the rail for the railway system, um, and uh, in order to do, do that, I need to understand the amount of emissions that have gone into mining that steel, um, uh, in, into processing the steel, forming it, transporting it to the factory, uh, and so on. You can get down to the level of the um, of the material involved in in the shed where the farmer parks his. His, his farm his farm equipment so it you really are handling handling a large amount of information life cycle assessments um, one thing I point out here are these uh, dotted lines in our schematic here they're, they're really representing the fact that co2 um, is an end product if you like of sugar 
um, but we've stopped with representing dotted lines because that CO2 is reabsorbed, if you like, by the plant in its life cycle, assuming that you replant the sugar cane. And uh, in, it's a feature of life cycle assessment of biomass that we don't actually consider the CO2 being, uh, being emitted in our process because it is, as I say, regenerated. And so we can consider it as being sort of uh, out of the circuit. Basically, we're considering inputs that are not renewable. So LCA doesn't just report on, uh, on, on carbon emissions. It reports on a whole range of things, and I've, I've listed them here. I won't, I won't read them out. But basically, what I'll be covering in this webinar is the software that we've developed to track uh, carbon emissions and the effect of those carbon emissions on, on global warming. So I thought I'd throw a brief slide in giving a potted history of, of uh, modern LCA. If for no other reason, just to indicate how recent it is, if you like, as a, as, as a science, um, <clears throat> it started really just after the Second World War when there was a, a lot of shortage of oil and, and uh, coal and resources and so on. And there were a lot of calculations underway to determine um, the uh, effectiveness of employing other forms of um, uh, of energy, such as nuclear, geothermal, and so on. And what they, the sort of calculations they were doing were, how much energy do I have to put into this process to recover um, my uh, end use of energy? And how does that end use compare to the amount that I put in? And, and what that put together was a series of um, a sort of methodologies that have really been adopted by life cycle assessment, but more in relation to um, uh, environmental emissions rather than, rather than energy inputs. So in the early 1960s, the first forerunners of LCA uh, were conceived in Europe, Europe and the US. Um, they used multi-criteria approach. They weren't just concerned with, uh, 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 with carbon emissions. Um, Coca-Cola was um, very much a, a forerunner in the, in the process of putting together methodologies for environmental um, profiles of different uh, packages of theirs. And um, they looked at uh, different methodologies and tried to standardize the methodologies um, because they found that basically, depending on the methodology you used, you really got quite different results. It wasn't until the 1990s that um, uh, some sort of consensus was reached through um, processes which were initiated by the Society of Environmental Toxicologists and Chemistry. Um, and then that eventually was um, uh, brought under uh, the ISO. And in 1996, the first ISO standard um, on, um, on life cycle assessment was produced. So 1996, it's, that's pretty recent in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of any kind of uh, uh, um, science, if you like, that, uh, that's around today. And what it still acknowledges, these standards, is that there's still a wide range of results possible through, um, through the choice of your methodology in life cycle assessment. And that's going to be a little bit of a theme through the uh, through the webinar. Now, one of the questions sent through prior to the webinar was, um, what are the main drivers for developing LCA? Um, and these have certainly changed since the, um, since the onset of this project, since this project was first conceived. But I think um, currently one of the most important drivers is really to be able to provide the end users with the sustainability information about your product. And providing that information might be in several forms. It might be responding to requests for information and data from stakeholders. So people who are also trying to establish the environmental credentials of their products, which use, for example, sugar. So it might be someone producing chocolate, for example. Uh, they want to know what, um, what the environmental uh, credentials are of, the, of their suppliers. Um, it's also through voluntary provision of information, uh, information on websites and annual reports. And if you go to the um, if, if you go to the websites of Nestle and Coca-Cola and Unilever, you'll find large amounts of documentation on their uh, on their environmental credentials, including life cycle uh, uh, assessment. Um, it's also um, uh, it's also in terms of business development. Um, the life cycle assessment isn't actually um, uh, required under, for carbon abatement project, projects under the current government's direct action plan. Um, the abatement really um, under 
under the um, action plan is really demonstrated by reductions of emissions as reported under under the uh, under the neighbor scheme. Um, however, the sale of products into the international market will increasingly require certification to environmental and sustainability standards, which require a demonstration of life cycle environmental impacts. And uh, examples of these are, are, are Bon Sucro, who, who uh, produce a, um, a standard for, for the sugar industry. And looking on their website recently, I noticed that uh, New South Wales Sugar and Bundaberg uh, Sugar are, are um, are, are, are registered under this under this scheme. Uh, going through the markets um, recently, I was in the UK going through the supermarkets. Uh, you see a lot of um, uh, you see a lot of products with um, uh, with this sort of labelling on. It's uh, it's it's um, it's a labelling that uh, and that is put on by virtue of them being registered with the Carbon Trust, and uh, it gives information on the on the um, on the carbon footprint, if you like, of of the product, and there's, a, there's an increasing demand for, uh, for for this sort of information uh, uh, from consumers. Um, in terms of influencing government policy, it's uh, it's really essential to be able to provide a, a compelling and consistent sustainability story, uh, particularly when you're looking for support uh, for the production of new sugarcane derived uh, derived products. Um, it's also useful essentially just for um, internal purposes, uh, really minimizing the waste and, and commercial risks through knowing more about the environmental impact of your operation. Um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 there are, and there are potentially direct uh, financial benefits of, of, of being able to do that. So a little bit more about the LCA process itself. Um, if you look to the to the standards, um, it's uh, it, it really defines LCA as a four stage pro pro process. Um, the first part, the goal and scope, that really describes the uh, uh, well. It really is decided by the end use and the and the target audience, um, and it and it affects the form of your outputs and the how much detail you go to into your into your study. Um, the scope itself identifies all the products that you're going to be concerned with, um, the disposal and the recycling and the sub-processes as well, and decides where you want to draw your boundaries. What, 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 what is the area that you're, uh, that you're actually concerned with? Are you concerned with just looking at sugarcane or are you concerned with looking at the sugarcane and all its products? So that's the goal uh, and scope. Um, the, um, Inventory an analysis is really a compilation of data on all the environmental flows, you know, resource inputs and pollutant outputs, and their associated impact on on the environment, and um, and the impact assessment is really putting all this information to determine an overall environmental impact. And the fourth stage is really uh, very critical, and and that is a a look at your data um, to determine that it actually makes sense. What are the what are the uh, key sensitivities? Um, uh, how much? How, how good is the data that you've uh, been used in the process, and and which of these uh, uh, may require require uh, more or, uh, or 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 better data? I just want to cover one or two topics um, in LCA. As I said earlier, just to give people um, uh, a bit of background that uh, that will help um, some of the later part of this um, uh, presentation make sense. The first is to do with system boundaries, and 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 we mentioned that in the in the goal and scope uh, that was talked about early. And really, the system boundary, um, if you want to define that, is really encompasses all the unit processes of direct relevance to the end product. So. Um, in the case of the sugar industry, it would, it would encompass the whole production process, the, the, the farming uh, and the factory and so on. You can have more than one, you can define more than one boundary in, in, your, in your system, um, but uh, ideally you'd like to minimize the number of product outputs leaving any, any one system. And the reason for that is you can sort of start to see, and we'll say a bit more about this later, and that is if you have more than one product leaving this boundary, you, you're then left with the um, with the problem of having to decide how much of your um, 
uh, in environmental impact is due to, say, raw sugar, and how much is, say, due, due to the molasses leaving the um, uh, leaving the factory. And that's a decision really you'd like to try and avoid if you can, because it's you're you're, you're probably uh, on, on shaky ground as soon as you have to make those decisions. Um, you try to include any uh, recycle within the processes. So here we have, for example, the factory might said, send uh, um, uh, mill mud back to the farm. You want to make sure that your boundary that you have here uh, encompasses that. And so in doing that, you, you also encompass these, these other two. So you have more than one, but you, you couldn't avoid that because you had to encompass this, this recycle stream, if you like. So within these boundaries, you've, you've actually determined uh, what the what the emissions are, what the uh, inputs are, and what the associated emissions are with those inputs. What are the outputs? What are you putting out to the environment, and uh, and so on? And you're producing something at the end of the day, and that's the whole idea. But how do you um, how do you assign uh, environmental impact, if you like, to all of your products if you have more than um, one product? And this can be done by different methods. One one of them is allocation. Uh, and that is where you say you share the environmental impact in proportion to the mass of the product. So um, if, you're, uh, uh, if you're sharing it uh, between sugar molasses and um, not sugar and molasses, you take the, uh, the mass of sugar and the mass of molasses, and you say the mass, uh, the amount of uh, my environmental impact that goes out with the sugar is, uh, is, is the fraction of, uh, fractional mass of sugar as a, as a, uh, as a fraction of the total. Um, you can do that by mass, you can do that by energy content, uh, you can do it by value if you like as well. There's a, there's a number of, of different ways of allocating this. Uh, but what the standards say is that, um, uh, and you're probably thinking this as well, that this is rather a dodgy way of, uh, of allocating emissions. And if you can, then you avoid that by either dividing your process so that you only have one product coming out of your, uh, out of your boundary or you look at expanding the product system, and we'll talk a bit uh, about the system expansion process. So this this just uh, this schematic just summarizes the um, uh, the uh, actual um, uh, allocation process, and it says uh, essentially that um, uh, you've got inputs coming into your agricultural process here. You allocate it uh, those uh, environmental impacts to your to your three products. And you can then produce, uh, for each of these products, you can produce then uh, a, a carbon footprint, if you like, here. So here we've got the carbon footprint for electricity, and we can compare it then with gas-fired gas -fired power. <coughs> um, again, another method of uh, assigning environmental impact is to look at system expansion. Here you actually expand the boundaries to include the environmental impact of the end product. Um, and uh, and that gets around the the problem of having to uh, assign the uh, uh, the impacts to to multiple products, and all ping, all impacts are, are assigned to what's called a determining product, and we'll talk a bit more about this later. Where the determining product is the product that determines the production volume of that process. So in the sugar process, obviously the production of sugar. Um, it is a determining product. You don't increase your, your, the amount of cane you crush in order to necessarily um, uh, 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 generate more power. So this schematic really shows um, the way that that information is display, displayed from um, uh, when you're using system expansion. So here we say that here's our agricultural uh, processing plant. We've got uh, products coming, we've got inputs coming in from outside of there and we're producing food, fodder, and electricity. And we say, OK, we've expanded our uh, system to include the consequences of that fodder. And the consequence is that you can displace the use of sorghum as feed. Or with electricity, you can displace the use of uh, electricity from gas-fired power. And that's re represented in this form on, uh, for uh, system expansion, where this bit at the top here really refers to the amount of um, inputs, if you like, the environmental impact of your inputs. Uh, that's the, the bad bit, if you like. And this bit down here represents the benefit. This is all the emissions that you've avoided as a result of displacing, um, displacing products. Um, I was a bit 
in two minds as to whether to present this, but um, I decided to go for it anyway uh, to compare allocation and system expansion, mainly to show that there is a different brought, difference in your result brought about by the methodology. So here, for example, we've got um, all the uh, environmental impact of producing molasses uh, is given to um, uh, is, is is given to sugar, which means that your um, your molasses goes to a distillery process with no associated emissions. Uh, so the only emissions as associated with um, uh, with ethanol, if you're assuming a system expansion, is those due to the inputs to the ethanol process. So these appear as quite small. Um, whereas if you look at a, a carbon footprint type approach, where you're looking at allocation, and you say, OK, I'm going to allocate some emissions to sugar, some to molasses, those travel through into the process here, are split up into ethanol and fertilizer, and the amount that ends up in your ethanol is, is, is larger, apparently. So which of these is correct? And the, the rather irritating answer is that actually both of them are correct, and it's very often a common practice to, uh, to, to represent both of these, these results. So in terms of the software platforms that are, are available for LCA, um, uh, I, I guess there's, there's two approaches. One is to uh, uh, produce your software in-house. So you could, for example, uh, use Excel. Um, this has a low initial cost. All you have to do is use uh, Microsoft Office, um, but the, it's very labor intensive. Um, you have to, you have to um, source all your data externally. And uh, as I've hinted earlier, this is, this is not a trivial task. Um, it's good for highly specialized single product sets where you don't expect a lot of variation in the, in the process or the inputs and so on, uh, or even just sort of one-off um, uh, type applications. The other option is commercial uh, software. Um, initially, could be quite expensive. Um, uh, you, have to, the, you then have to um, undertake uh, training and so on. But the pluses are that it's very versatile. It's usually well documented if someone sets up a system in, 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 in a commercial, a bit of commercial software and uh, retires or whatever, um, uh, you could, you've, you've, you've still got a model which is, is well documented and, and easily accessed. Um, you have access to extensive inventory and impact factor databases, which I'll talk about a bit later. And, uh, and, and this is really quite a major advantage. Uh, there's lots of ways of post-processing using um, uh, using commercially available software, and basically there are two two main ones, um, and those are Simapro, which which we use here, uh, uh, and Gaby, which is a uh, I believe a, a European uh, software uh, package. So down to the <coughs> um, the um, nitty gritty, if you like, um, our, we've developed a, a, a sugar industry tool. Uh, that was developed um, under with SRDC and SRA funding. There were actually two being developed at the same time. One was for the cane production side of things, and that was uh, undertaken by Marguerite Renouf at, uh, at the University of Queensland. And basically, they covered the harvested cane, um, and they looked at multiple environmental impacts because those were of uh, great interest to the uh, to to the end users, the the, the growers. Um, and the software that we were involved in was developed under Project QT027, um, which really took the extended that life cycle system all the way at, uh, all the way to end products, and and uh, and and had a sing single environmental impact factor, which is basically your your global warming potential. So different industry sectors had different requirements, um, but it, essentially um, these were. Uh, these these two projects were were run very much um, in in, uh, uh, in in parallel to each other, and there was a fair amount of communication between the those running the projects. So, talking now about the project that um, was used to develop the software um, that I'm concerned with, uh, the project was opportunities for the Australian sugar industry in greenhouse gas abatement and carbon trading. If you want to look it up on the website, uh, funded by um, SRA. And really, it was originally intended to assist the industry in preparing um, for the introduction of uh, greenhouse gas abatement mechanisms. And I guess it was put together in the um, in, in the days um, uh, post 2007, where uh, where there was an expectation that there would be um, uh, that there would be a carbon trading system, and and this sort of tool would have a lot of application there. So I say, <coughs> in terms of its use, this is uh, this has changed somewhat over the over the course of the project. 
So the model itself, um, just describing that very briefly, it, it sort of has two parts to it. One is the uh, is is if you like a a, a set of templates that has that's been developed um, that really have been uh, customized to. Uh, to, to take in input data and to prompt you for input data that are relevant to doing life cycle assessment in the in the sugar industry um, and having said they they're, they're, they're uh, customized they're, they're also customizable and uh, and fairly customized easily customizable to represent a, a large range of uh, different processes so what these Excel templates do is they they uh, they, they apart from receiving data uh, and prompting you for data and supplying some of that data itself. It does a lot of the mass and energy balances to ensure that you, uh, you're not losing energy and mass in your, in your process. And it develops a, an output sheet, if you like, uh, in the form that can be, um, uh, that can be inputted from, uh, from your, your main uh, software, from your LCA software. Um, so it, ge it generates this, uh, this Excel sheet. Uh, which, as I say, can be used as an import. Those Excel sheets can be then stored away, if you like, uh, as, as scenario libraries. You can you can bring in uh, uh, if you're doing a, a, another um, scenario. You can bring in one that looks very similar, and you can readily modify it um, with very little um, with very little input to uh, um, uh, to to your new scenario. So that information is passed on to the uh, uh, LCA software. Uh, Simapro in this case, and that produces the conventional um, uh, LCA outputs. So in terms of data ent entry, um, this really handles material and energy inputs, the sort of two lots of uh, inputs. Uh, farming, harvesting, so we have to go all the way back to the whole production process. Um, it, uh, it provides you uh, with regional data from drop-down menus because a lot of this data is not very, very easy to get hold of, but it has uh, sort of databases built into it. Um, it, uh, it. It allows you to put in all the chemical inputs, um, supplementary fuels, coals, the amount of trash that you bring in, the amount of bagasse you bring in from other uh, uh, regions as well, and so on. Configuration really describes um, the process uh, that you want to um, uh, that you're using to produce this um, this product, whether it's um, sugar or ethanol or power, and, uh, and and the factory setup, the particular factory setup that you have in order to do this. So this allows you to readily customize your your spreadsheet to uh, to do this. The factory model um, template is really, as I say, uh, a mass and energy balance, really. And it, it tracks material flows uh, of pole bricks, ash, and fib mo fiber moisture and mud solids, because there are effluent um, streams uh, associated with, with many of these. Um, it undertakes um, sugar recovery, molasses uh, production and, and balance calculations. It looks at the factory energy production, um, uh, and so it uses information that you put in on, on, on factory energy consumption to do this. And coupled to the cogeneration uh, and, and other co-process models, uh, it looks at, um, uh, at, at um, uh, balancing your, uh, your um, energy and material flow requirements. So the co-process models are, um, are, are really uh, take some of the um, uh, are, are really connected to the main factory model, and they calculate the co-process energy and material flow. So very similar calculations to the uh, to the raw sugar factory, but but for these other co-processes, again it balances factory energy and material um, outputs um, with the co-process uh, requ requirements. Um, it includes the use of uh, supplementary feedstocks in order to provide the, the energy to, to, to run these processes. In terms of the Simipro LCA model, that's been uh, set up to accept um, uh, a, uh, a set of inputs, a standard set of inputs, uh, which really uh, um, describe in great detail a, uh, a, a sugar industry-based um, based scenario. And it really reflects some of the processes um, uh, in Excel. Uh, so it's a, if you like, it's almost a parallel model. Um, <coughs> and uh, it's, it accesses uh, libraries to, uh, to uh, provide data that's not 
um, that's not necessarily sugar industry specific. So, for example, if you're looking at the emissions associated with, with lime, it, the, the, that sort of information is available uh, from uh, databases like, um, uh, uh, like the Australian system and unit processors. Um, it looks for, for other information not available uh, for local conditions. It looks uh, at other uh, libraries, European and, and, and US potentially. Um, and it also handles the assigning of impacts to, to, to multiple um, product streams. I'll probably um, cover this very briefly. Um, it's uh, the way in which the, the system handles uh, system boundaries. Um, and I guess I'm mentioning it really because um, this model really does quite a bit for you in terms of deciding where the boundaries should be and how they, they should be appropriately, um, uh, appropriately uh, located, if you like. Um, so for example, um, in a uh, sugar industry scenario where you're importing uh, additional fuels, uh, such as, um, for example, uh, coal and bagasse, the last thing you want is, um, is for the emissions associated with coal to be uh, appearing as, uh, as, as part of your um, uh, uh, raw sugar production because there's no way that you need coal um, uh, in any large quantity to produce raw sugar. So although these fuels are physically burnt in the same boilers and, and the steam passes through the same turbines, uh, the process um, in the software is sort of splits it up so that um, it put different, puts different boundaries around the, the amount of um, emissions that are associated with, uh, with your um, uh, auxiliary fuel. So that's just by way uh, of an example really of, of some of the things that uh, this does. So we use this um, software to, uh, to, to undertake some regional case studies and we, we chose to contrasting regions, one, one based, uh, a scenario based at uh, Racecourse Mill, um, uh, Mackay Sugar, and the other, the other at, a, uh, at a Wilmar Mill, then Sucrogen, Pioneer Mill. And we chose them because they had both contrasting farming and harvesting practices. So Mackay really harvests, 91% of its cane is harvested green, uh, and compared to Burdekin where, where uh, about 5% is harvested uh, green. And the Burdekin has a heavy reliance on irrigation, and, and irrigation has emissions associated with that, so it was interesting to see how that would impact on the, uh, on, on the embodied emissions. They also had quite contrasting diversification scenarios, so we weren't really terribly interested in comparing uh, sugar from one with sugar uh, uh, with the other. It was more looking at what happens when you actually introduce uh, diversification, what were the impacts of that. And um, and really trying to put some uh, some uh, numbers on a on a real scenario. So describing the Mackay regional case study a little bit more, um, this was really very much an integrated uh, process of uh, raw sugar production, power export, refined sugar, and uh, and ethanol. Um, the factory steam cycle was very much consistent with the 30 megawatts uh, extracting condensing set they have set up there. Uh, it assumes year-round steam generation and electricity, steam electricity production, um, and uh, and it assumes the existing. It has to supply power and steam to the existing refinery, which, which produces 450 kilotons of uh, bulk white sugar. It also assumes a proposed uh, molasses to ethanol um, uh, plant as well. Uh, in order to run this. Um, uh, there's, it's necessary under some scenarios to uh, in, in import the gas um, from off the race course site. And we looked at uh, a couple of uh, fuel scenarios. One was using coal, and that was our sort of um, uh, base case scenario. And the other was looking at um, introducing, uh, 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 bringing in uh, additional the gas. The Burdekin region case study was really one where um, the focus was on um, existing raw sugar production and, and, and power export. Uh, again, it was based on their existing steam cycle, uh, their, their 70, uh, 37 megawatt um, high pressure condensing power plant. This power plant's not um, uh, uh, significantly um, integrated into the sugar production process. So again, that, would, that makes an interesting um, a, a comparison there. 
and there's no steam extracted from the uh, TEVA alternator for sugar processing. And that involves as well importing uh, bagasse from surrounding factories. Uh, and this, this uh, bagasse is, is um, uh, transported by the road and uh, by road. And again, you'd expect um, uh, um, uh, environmental impacts associated with, with that transport process. So in undertaking this, um, this regional case study, a, the, the, basically the templates were sent off to uh, the people at, um, uh, at Mackay Sugar and, uh, and uh, at Wilmar who were undertaking these studies. And uh, these are fairly well um, annotated, if you like, um, uh, spreadsheets. They're also spreadsheets um, that use, have a lot of uh, aids, if you like, to, um, uh, to uh, providing data that uh, you may otherwise find uh, difficult to get hold of. Um, it allows you to, um, uh, to construct uh, a large amount of your um, diversification scenarios simply by, um, uh, by ActiveX control. So you could click a box which says refinery and it'll then come up and prompt you for all the inputs required for, uh, for a refinery, likewise for uh, a distillery and, uh, and so on. It will offer you a series of um, uh, 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 default values. And some of these default values can be modified depending on the, the region that the analysis is, is, is being undertaken for. So there are drop down menus that would provide that, um, uh, that data there. And you can then transfer, you have the option of transferring that, um, <laughs> that, 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 um, uh, that, that data, uh, that default data into your main data set or, or not. And, uh, or uh, transferring it and then uh, and then modifying it, so it gives you a lot of assistance in the in the process of supplying the required data. Um, <laughs> it's also another template that went out was a very similar one which requested information on um, on on the process being set up. So it asked a lot of questions about the sort of um, uh, the steam cycle, uh, uh, the amount of uh, the number of drives in there, the turbine drives, uh, electric drives. Um, uh, um, hydraulic, electric, um, uh, and, uh, um, and, and so on. Um, and uh, it allows you to uh, say how much of, uh, it allows you a number of boilers, it allows you to say which fuel is burned in which boilers uh, and, and for how long. Um, it's, uh, it provides a lot of uh, calculators as well, so things like steam cycles, steam tables and so on. So again, it gives you a lot of assistance in, in providing the, the data. Once this, um, these spreadsheets are returned, they're connected to the rest of the model and you can then do, um, it uses that data to do uh, a material and, and mass balance. And, um, and you can manually check that. Um, this is a, a sort of uh, a screen dump of part of that. It's quite an extensive sort of mass energy balance. Um, again, similar thing for the, uh, for, for the um, energy balance. Uh, and you can you can uh, check outputs and and so on against uh, ex against expected outputs, and check essentially that you're 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 conserving your your energy and uh, and, and materials. You're not generating materials mysteriously at any any point in the process. It also allows you to sl um, uh, flip between the different allocation methods. So it does the sort of calculations. The template does the calculations that you would need for mass allocation. Um, it prompts you for information that, that you would need for perhaps um, um, looking at uh, 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 financial allocation. And it also prompts you for possible uh, replacement products if you're looking at um, system expansion. And using the, uh, the inputs uh, and, and these sort of calculated outputs, you can, um, you can easily flip between one sort of um, analysis uh, and, and another. So just talking, uh, touching very briefly on some of the outputs. Um, these are mentioned a bit more in a bit more detail in an ASSCT paper. Um, but I guess uh, I thought they were worth reproducing here. Um, perhaps one of the most uh, immediate observations. So here we're looking at a carbon footprint, if you like, um, comparing uh, the global warming potential of, um, uh, of, of producing um, a, a ton of raw sugar produced in the Mackay region and the Burdekin region. Um, again, for both of those, you can see the majority of the inputs are actually uh, on the cane production side here. 
So this is field emissions. That's the release of nitrous uh, um, nitrous oxides um, from some of the uh, nitrogen compounds added to the uh, in, uh, as as fertilizer. Here are some of the agricultural production inputs. So the production of um, uh, fertilizers is is very energy intensive, and that shows up here. Um, I guess some of the regional differences are are, are really in the um, the fact that. Um, in the Burdekin, um, you you do a lot of irrigation, so some of the that irrigation here shows up as a as a large emission, and compared to perhaps in the Mackay region, uh, there's also burning of the cane, and burning of the cane is is not an efficient combustion process, uh, and and so it tends to um, it tends to add to, uh, add to the to to the overall um, emissions. Looking at power exports, um, uh, things flip the other way, and you can see that. Um, if you include the emissions associated with using coal, then your, uh, the, the, the global warming potential of producing kilowatt hour of power um, really reflects the use of that coal. It's, it's, it produces uh, quite a high uh, uh, carbon footprint. If you were to replace that by that coal by um, uh, imported the gas, um, your emissions obviously go down very significantly. Um, but they, there's, there's also a significant component uh, due to the fact that you're actually importing emissions when you uh, embodied emissions, if you like, when you when you import the import the bagasse. And the bagasse has been produced in factories that only produce, say, sugar and surplus bagasse. So the total emissions produced in that region are allocated between only two products: that's sugar and bagasse. So the bagasse picks up a fair amount of emissions um, before it's transported down the road. Uh, to be burnt in a in uh, at, um, uh, at at racecourse, so there's there's still a significant amount of emissions associated there. Um, probably all I want to say about that. Um, it, then the case study then w went on to look at what would happen um, uh, to the global warm, warming potential of producing ethanol. So this is uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of ethanol. In your base case, um, <coughs> using coal, uh, your your emissions look something like this, and you can see that um, <coughs> that uh, the emissions associated with uh, producing ethanol using coal are are larger, but not very significantly larger than those using um, uh, uh, using imported bagasse. And the reasons for this is I haven't really got much time to discuss it here, but most of the reduction in emissions when coal is replaced by bagasse. Turn up in the export power rather than the um, uh, rather than the ethanol because um, the ethanol mainly uses um, uh, uh, the additional LP steam produced, um, and this has a lot to do with the way mass allocation works um, uh, when assigning emissions to electricity, um, which which gets its emissions via the mass of fuel required to produce the power, and it sort of highlights some of the inadequacies, if you like, of mass allocation as an approach um, in, in this case. Um, uh, same story, really, for uh, for the refined sugar. So, some general conclusions from our regional case studies: um, the uh, regional differences in embodied emissions are are, are are dominated by field effects. So, 75 to 80 percent of the total global warm potential of cane production um, is uh, is is um, it happens in the field. Uh, it's impacted significantly by irrigation and harvesting practice, and uh, and I think one of the things it uh, highlights as well, because so much is dependent on the on the field emissions, is that we do need better data in in uh, in determining those field emissions. Um, it's also highlighted the fact that selection of um, appropriate selection of boundaries is is critical, so that we don't have uh, coal burning uh, increasing the emissions associated with sugar production. Um, and uh, <coughs> use of uh, coal as supplementary fuel is is a relatively small contributor to the emissions of ethanol um, compared to uh, export power. We found that transporting um, uh, fuel around doesn't have many associated emissions in the grander scheme of things, and Im imported bagasse comes with a fair amount of uh, uh, emissions associated with it. That's probably all I want to say about the. Uh, Sugar industry regional case studies. Um, so we've we've got essentially uh, two sugar industry LCA tools developed: one for cane production and the other for the one I've been talking about, which is uh, processing to uh, to other materials. 
Um, I'd just like to say that they were developed in, in very close collaboration. Marguerite Renouf, who was managing the, the um, UQ045, was in, uh, was in um, very regular contact with myself. Uh, and also, we, we, we're going to maintain, um, I guess, consistency between the outputs um, by, by using the same lifecycle inventory uh, uh, databases uh, and also following the same uh, international standards. I want to pr um, press on and cover very briefly the, um, uh, uh, an application um, uh, that's been used since the development of the model. Um, and, and it's been, one, it's been the main application um, uh, uh, since completion of the project. And it uses the customized LCA software um, in, evaluate, in evaluating the emissions associated with sweet sorghum and, and, and uh, bio. We've uh, <clears throat> we run fermentation trials on the uh, on on the uh, sugars that are produced, and did a techno-economic and and life cycle assessment uh, analysis as well. So sweet sorghum uh, we were interested in, or um, because essentially it's something that can be run um, uh, in in regions of um, of sugar producing areas which are which are, which are marginal for uh, sugar cane production. It's highly productive. It it produces two crops a year. Uh, the stalk produces uh, uh, sugars, but these don't crystallize very easily, so it's, it's more useful as a food sweetener. Uh, but <clears throat> we start to see some differences in the, in the profile, if you like, of the, uh, of the emission. So, for example, in our sweet sorghum, uh, which, is, uh, which is harvested, uh, two, two crops are harvested to, uh, in the production process. So you can see increased inputs from, uh, on, the, on the farming side and so on. The other thing is that there was a lot of uncertainty associated with our, our, our sorghum calculations. Uh, out in the literature, they were claiming very high production rates, which we didn't see, 120 tons a hectare, which would obviously reduce our emissions and, uh, and uh, very low uh, production rates, which would uh, increase the per ton emissions. So we, we looked at those sorts of things. Um, we then looked at a, a consequential analysis or an expansion system analysis. So just to remind you, this is where we looked at the, um, the, envir the, the carbon footprint, if you like, are associated with putting uh, the inputs uh, to, the, to the process. So these are represented above the line here. So these are the, these are the bad things. And down here is all the um, avoided emissions as a result of, of, of the products that, um, that, that are produced in the, in the biorefinery. And I guess the story to come out of this was that um, <coughs> essentially, the uh, emissions associated with the actual production process itself uh, in the biorefinery are very small. They're these little green bits at the top here. And most of the emissions, as with uh, sugar production, happen, happen out in the field. And we can see that uh, as a result of what we produce, we can get very large uh, CO2 um, uh, offsets, if you like. So that was, a, that was an encouraging um, outcome from that particular project. That pretty well. Um, summarizes what I've just said in relation to that previous diagram. So in the interest of finishing on time, I'll, I'll skip that. In terms of access to project uh, software, um, it's the Excel-based uh, interface and, and uh, generic Simipro model is IP owned by QUT. And it, uh, um, I guess our protection on that is, is copyright. Um, this is not a, a money grab, really, but the industry access really has to be, we see as having to be through, uh, uh, through a consulting process where um, QT staff are commissioned to undertake LCA work on a consulting basis. And the idea here really is to have a, a continuing revenue to this, to this area so that we can, uh, we can continue to uh, develop our, uh, our, our LCA models and our, uh, uh, maintain our capabilities and our uh, maintain current licenses, uh, ensure that we have uh, up to the up to the up to the minute uh, data available for our analyses, and also um, to fund any activities relating to um, essentially 
either representing or, or keeping in touch with um, with what's happening on the uh, on the LCA front. So concluding, really, uh, this is a, a tool for reducing the cost of undertaking LCA. Uh, we produce an Excel uh, spreadsheet, which is a front end, which uh, does the assist you very much in producing your LCA, uh, uh, constructing your LCA scenario. Um, we've done some regional uh, specific case studies uh, for sugar uh, products and and sweets organ, um, and uh, we say any ongoing maintenance, develop really development activities uh, being funded by uh, uh, co ongoing consulting work in in this area. So. That's pretty well all I want to cover. Just want to acknowledge uh, the funding from SRA uh, for this particular project. Also, Brian Edwards and Jay Venning from Wilmar and Sucrogen at the time, and John Hodgson from Mackay Sugar. Uh, they, they were a lot of assistance in providing data for our regional case studies. We had an industry reference group um, reviewing the outputs of this project. And um, so uh, I thank Sharon Denny, Bernie Milford, uh, John Hodgson, and Bianca Cairns, Ben Baldwin. Um, also, last but not least, Marguerite Renouf, um, who had uh, a, a lot of input into this. She's um, she's uh, a, a well-known guru in the in the field of LCA in relation to the sugar industry. 